Good afternoon, everybody. This is Yehuda Shamroth, the acupuncturist, nurse anesthetist, and herbalist from Ramat Beit Shemesh, Israel. Today, I happen to be broadcasting from Netanya, Israel, a little bit different than my usual location. I do a weekly webinar on health and wellness topics of all kinds, and you can check my YouTube channel, RBS Acupuncture, to see about two years worth of really interesting topics of anything from health and wellness, fitness, exercise, diet, uh, emotional health, physical health, um, mental health, everything we did in our class last time on mental health and the holistic viewpoint. So I try to bring in guest speakers. Sometimes it's easy to do that and sometimes it isn't. But luckily I've got some really great ones lined up for the next year. I am doing just once a month during the summer. So everybody's taking a break, including myself. So this week's topic, without further ado, is on balancing our blood sugar and how important it is. Um, now, it's my, not in my usual setup, so I'm going to be looking off and on a screen. I really apologize. I'm going to have to use my same laptop for my slides. So it's going to be a little bit awkward. I'm so sorry, but that's what's going to be for me here <laughs> in a second, if I can get it together. Okay, let's try to get this together. And um, all right, let's see if I can do this. No, that's not working. Okay. Let me see. I'm going to end this show for a second and go back to myself. And we're going to share the screen. Share the screen for the probably for the rest of the lecture. Okay. Sharing the screen. I forgot how to do it. Can't do it. Okay. Not sharing my screen too well, I guess. Let's put this up first. Oh, I really apologize. I'm terrible, terrible technical. I just did this a minute ago. All right. Okay, fine, got that. We're gonna go back here. Go share the screen one more time. And we're gonna go to the window and we're gonna go here. Okay. That could be it. All right. That could be it. All right, everybody, here we are. What you can do to keep your blood sugar in good balance. Now, again, I'm not sure if I'm looking at you or at my screen, so please forgive me, but I can't see. All I can see are my slides right now. But we wanna talk about keeping our sugar, our blood sugar in good balance, whether or not we're diabetics. We're talking about everyday people like you and me, and thank God, even though I am 64 years old, and I do have a, fa I have a father who had diabetes. Um, I don't, you know, you can, you can be not necessarily be plagued with that that diagnosis of diabetes, you can prevent it. And we can keep our blood sugar in very good balance by just taking good care of our eating habits and our health. We do know that um, blood sugar has major implications on how we feel and function on a daily basis, uh, but it doesn't have to be difficult. So this is not a class about diabetes. This is not even geared towards diabetic people, although I think diabetic people will get a good uh, deal of information out of here. You might even be able to call me up and give me some more uh, information and tips for me to teach next time. But what we eat to manage our blood fish, uh, pressure, our blood uh, sugar, and when we eat it, uh, we want to prevent what we call blood pressure glucose or blood glucose spikes. And spikes are really unhealthy for us, which I'll explain. Uh, we'll learn how some specific foods can uh, really help us do this, and how we don't have to give up all of our favorite foods, not even carbs, believe it or not. And you know, this is variable from person to person. So any one food that you might eat like a cookie or, or an apple even, will have a different uh, blood uh, glucose effect on each individual person. It depends on your age, it depends on your metabolism, it depend, depends on where you're holding in your health um, pattern right now. Uh, kids are different than adults, old people, young people, everybody has a different uh, metabolism. So even though we look at things like uh, uh, blood glucose index, which I'll talk about, and H1, H1C and things like that. It's going to be different from individual to individual, but we do have to talk in general terms to teach the population just how to take care of our, of our eating. And just you should know, it's not as scary as all that. It is very um, it's very easy to manage your blood pressure. Or <laughs> I want to say blood pressure. Uh, we manage your blood sugar. Manage your blood sugar, your blood glucose, uh, without going crazy, without getting all kinds of testing. Now, if you are a diabetic, you are going to want to take good care of yourself every single day and test yourself every day. But this is not the situation I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about the average individual who really has a big concern about their children and their family's health and their own health and how not to eat uh, foods that will knock your blood sugar out of balance. 
So I want to, I think I forgot a slide, did I? Like 50%. Okay, so hyperglycemia is known as high blood pressure or high blood glucose. It means there are too much sugar in the blood and because the body lacks enough insulin for whatever reason, uh, it's different for people. Like in diabetes, of course, there might be something wrong with their pancreatic production. Uh, a lot of times with, with, um, with adult onset diabetes, which we see most of, uh, we know we kind of gave it to ourselves because we ate too much carbohydrates, high refined sugars and fats and uh, over the years and not taking good care of oneself. So we do know that uh, over worldwide, 463 million people around the world do have diabetes and more than 50% of us don't even know it until you get tested or until you still ha start having some symptoms. So associated with diabetes again is hyperglycemia. And you know, to the extreme, we're gonna talk about things like vomiting, excessive hunger and thirst rapid heartbeat, vision problems, and other symptoms. So if you experience any of these things, please see your doctor right away. Um, I knew a young woman and many young women and many young people who have had these symptoms. And the, really it was almost the last thing the doctors were looking for because they were young, they were teenagers. So they were teenagers that have vomiting and sudden weight loss or excessive hunger and thirst and rapid heartbeat and vision problems and other symptoms. So if, if your child is experiencing any of these things, think outside the box and get them tested for diabetes. But here, how can we have, how can we maintain a uh, healthy blood sugar for ourselves on a daily basis? We've heard the term "hangry." Are you hangry? Have you ever been hangry? My kids love to say that. It's when you're angry because you're hungry. So people who get low blood pre uh, blood sugar also have terrible symptoms. Here, we can have hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia, and some of the symptoms are the same. Um, your blood sugar might be the culprit of whatever emotional ups and downs you might have. So if you look on the left side of the screen, if you are hypoglycemic, I have family members who forget to eat all day long, they can start sweating, they can go pale, they can get very irritable, they're very hungry, obviously, a little bit of a lack of coordination and very tired and very dizzy. So you are, if you're a person who is not diagnosed with a blood sugar problem and you have not eaten all day long, you have what's known as hypoglycemia and you've got to feed yourself right away. Um, hyperglycemia, on the other hand, is what, a little bit what we're talking about today. A little bit different sy symptoms, dry mouth, uh, increased thirst. You can be very, very weak and headaches, blurred vision and frequent urination. So you wanna check these things out with your doctor no matter what age you are, because by eating the foods that keep your blood sugar balanced, you can reduce all this stuff. You can reduce crashes, you can reduce grouchiness. We can reduce all the problems that we are looking at right here. And um, again, there are going to be foods we can talk about too. Okay. Love this. Just love this. Here we go. I'm trying. I'm just so not technical. Let's see. Where are we? There we go. Okay. And we know that balancing our nutrition is the key to all of these um, balancing the healthy blood sugar levels. So if you know it and you're hungry, please eat. It could be a blood sugar problem, okay? And we do know that uh, inflammation is a problem too. So we want to make sure if we have any serious blood sugar problems, we check with our local doctors. Um, but the amazing, we should know that it's so amazing that the overwhelming majority of blood sugar issues we see in the world today are reversible. And this is such good news, preventable, they're manageable problems. And whenever you are, wherever you are on the insulin resistance spectrum or the inflammation spectrum or the blood sugar spectrum, you should know that you can have control of all what you eat. You can take care of this. These things are reversible, preventable, and manageable. And every, up, every time you sit down to a meal is an opportunity to take good care of yourself and heal any problems you might have. I've got two of these. That's what. Where are we? Sorry about that. Okay, we want to look at normal blood sugar for a minute there. Um, when you go for a blood test at your doctor's, uh, the average person, the average adult would have a fasting blood sugar, a blood glucose of 80 to 100. doesn't really matter what the scale is right now. I'm not going to, again, this is not a, a real technical discussion. But if you just ate something, you're going to have 170 to 200 around there. And three hours after eating, your blood sugar should start coming down to 120 to 40. Now, if you're pre-diabetic, you're going to be higher. So you want to keep track of these numbers as you get older, or even if you're having any of those symptoms I mentioned. Uh, you might start at 100 to 125. You, if you just ate, you're going to start at 200 to 230. And at three hours after eating, your blood sugar is going to be 140 to 160 range. Uh, now, if you're true diabetic, it's harder to maintain those, uh, those uh, values. Uh, you have to probably use a, a glucose medicine, glucose control medicine, like 
glyburide or something like that. Again, I'm not discussing medications in this. I'm not discussing diabetes at length, but you might want to go on a medication according with the uh, direction of your doctor or take insulin if it's very severe because your blood sugars are going to be in the 200. And when your blood sugars are in the 200, what happens inside the vessels is very damaging. We know from years past that sugar is very um, a damaging and sets up inflammation everywhere in the body, and it also feeds inflammation. So if you think of the internal uh, volume of the, the uh, lumen of your blood vessels as already having a little bit of inflammation, sugar adds to that, and it also kind of chops little holes in it too. And you can know that uh, when you have holes in your blood vessels, things are going to leak out that shouldn't leak out. And I'm not talking about leaky gut that happens in the, in the digestive system, but even in your own blood vessels, if they're leaking in any way, you're not going to get proper blood flow to the body. And this is why diabetics have issues with uh, healing in their, their extremities because they can't get the blood to flow to the tips of the toes, the tips of the fingers, and the uh, the blood isn't flowing properly. And it's, it's being stuck other places, getting edema, building edema other places. And the sugar is just wreaking havoc on all of the um, tissues. And it's very hard to heal from that. And again, sugar also is, uh, you know, makes inflammation even worse. So let's talk a minute about what is glycemic index. Uh, glycemic index is something we like to look at when it comes to foods, because this is the way we're going to help balance our blood sugar. So we want to eat certain foods that will follow these glycemic index chart. And by glycemic index, we mean what is the impact of that one food that you're eating on your blood sugar as you eat it? So when you see here, these are not specific foods, but you can see when you eat a high glycemic index food, your blood sugar spikes. And when you see, when you eat a low glycemic index food, it'll be low. So high, for examples of high glycemic foods are gonna be things like starchy and sugars and processed foods. Real high sugary stuff, pure candies and things like that. You get this big initial spike and it drops and then uh, if you eat something like green vegetables or any kind of uh, healthy uh, vegetables and fruits that have a low, there, there are tables of these things. I, it's too much for this topic for today, but I can refer you to where to look for these foods specifically. But if we if we train ourselves to eat low glycemic index foods, we won't have that spike. So what happens when we have a spike anyway? What's the problem with having a spike? So what happens is it gives you a, a, a artificial energy. When you eat this kind of food with nothing else in your stomach, if you eat a donut or if you eat a cereal that's sugary or eat candies and run, go on the run, and even these nature bars and things, they're doing a lot of research right now that these nature bars, I hate to put, I don't want to say anything specific, but they're not really good for us. And they do cause glucose spikes. They make you feel good for a little bit, for a short time. And then you have this crash and you can get headaches from that. And you can get uh, behavior problems in children from that. And then you're even hungry later on. So let's forget about diabetes for a minute. Let's talk about the fact that it wreaks havoc on your emotions. So anybody who has any depression or any kind of uh, anxiety, we have to be very careful about the way we feed ourselves because we have to know we want to stay away from high glu uh, glycemic index foods. When you have a crash, what we call a crash of uh, blood sugar, that means you're really out of balance. And people, uh, this goes on and on. And this is what is a setup for diabetes in the future. And your blood sugar could be all over the place if you feel all hungry all the time. You can't check your blood pressure every minute. But if you're just eating sugary foods all day long, and again, sugar is a big evil from today. It used to be fat, but sugar is the big evil now. And I believe that's true. Um, they've been doing some studies on cereals. Cereals are the worst things in the world to give your kids in the morning. And I figured this out many years ago without being such a earth mother and a health nut. But my kids were all one level or another of a little bit of ADHD. And we were told we were advised to get rid of the sugar as much as possible. So we reserved it for holidays and weekends and stuff like that. And in the mornings, it just seemed logical to me to not start their day with a bowl of cereal because it's all loaded, loaded, loaded with sugar. And then on top of that, you're gonna serve your child a glass of orange juice, which is another glass of sugar. So what we switched to is making eggs every morning with vegetables and salad, which is actually pretty Mediterranean anyway. We live in Israel. So it stabilized them, it steadied them, and they felt great all day, every day. And they sometimes didn't even feel like eating anymore until later in the day, which worried the teachers because they didn't always eat their lunches. That had something to do with their medication sometimes too. But you can you can know that the children did not have blood spikes, but blood sugar spikes, and they had a much more stabilized day. Um, so your, our goal is to keep our blood um, our blood pressure, uh, our blood sugar stable as possible all day long. So if you eat something with high carbohydrates or sugar, and you know your blood sugar is going to rise, and if you don't have a handle on it, it's going to turn into diabetes. 
So again, our blood sugar rises when we eat foods that contain sugar or foods that break down into sugar. Uh, basically anything that contains carbohydrates, breads, grains, fruit, veggies, dairy. And I do a lot of talking about the keto diet. That's very low carbohydrate. Um, I'm not talking about that today, but I do know that people do much better on that diet when it comes to glycemic index, when it comes to glucose spikes. They don't have those because the hormone insulin doesn't have to fight and run out all the time to mop up the sugar. And what happens is people end up developing something called insulin resistance. And that means we are so used to feeding our body's body sugar and the body is so used to pumping out insulin and it, and it doesn't, it's not effective anymore. So you are resistant to the insulin and your body is, uh, suffers for it. Okay, so there's something we like to talk about called A1C. That's a blood test. Okay. I want to talk a little bit more about the stability of blood pressure, blood sugar first. I can, I'm going to keep saying blood pressure. So we did talk about how, again, the signs, if you're having signs of your blood pressure or <laughs> your blood sugar being out of whack in one way or the other, you will be fatigued. You will have sugar and carb cravings even more and more. You will have weight gain. You'll have headaches. You'll have trouble concentrating, possibly mood swings and nervousness dry skin, excessive thirst, uh, frequent uh, urination, and blurred vision. And imagine a child going to school feeling like this, and some kids are already have ADHD, and you're sending them to school and a bowl of sugar, and they are already tired by the first hour of the morning, and they're already, and the kids might be gaining weight. Or even as adults, you go to work in the morning, you just grab a donut or a, a nature bar, and they, this is the worst thing in the world to start the morning with. I've been convinced for years, and uh, doing my research for this, I've been convinced. Okay, so we want to make sure we balance these things out with protein, fat, and fiber, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. So I think I've discussed this already. And, uh, and you want to check your blood sugar at home if you are someone who is a diabetic. Or if you feel like you're a pre-diabetic, please go get a blood test. Okay, so what is A1C anyway? The, ter the real whole term is HbA1c, And it's a, it's a test that, to look at the hemoglobin molecule. It's a strand, the A strand of the hemoglobin and the C, the A chain and the C strand or the Something like that. It's, it's, anyway, they're looking at a certain strand of hemoglobin and how it holds on to sugar, okay? It is the oxygen-carrying molecule, of course, in your body, and it's a measure of how, how much glucose is attached to the hemoglobin in your red blood cells. So we look at it every three to six months, and we do it, we get an average of it every three to six months. So you don't look at A1C in isolation, but this has become the new term for, um, for the new way of, of really monitoring people's glucose who are diabetics. And so you wanna make sure you get your A1C checked it's a number that's averaged over three months, and it can let us know how we're doing in, as a range of we're going better or we're going worse in terms of our, our, uh, our glucose uh, management. So we do know that um, we have test results on this. The uh, normal range of A1C, or the amount of hemoglobin holds onto glucose in your bloodstream, is about 5.7%. Anything below 5.7 is considered normal. Uh, you're considered a pre-diabetic if you're 5.7 to 6.4, and you are considered diabetes if you have 6.5 or higher. So this is one thing that we want to continue managing to, to monitor to keep the blood, blood sugar in good check. Okay, we're not ready for the food yet, but I'm going to get there in a few minutes. Okay, so every 8 to 12 weeks or so, they check this A1C number. And it's an average of all the glucose levels over the past two or three months, as I mentioned. So, so why is it good, important to check this again? Because the higher your average blood glucose levels over time, the higher your A1C will be. And we want to make sure we keep that down. We want to kind of reduce the points point by point by, by using good, good sense with our eating and eating balanced diet. Um, the single reading is really not so helpful. So that's why they do it every three two or three months. Um, and you want to make sure you can um, think of it as all your glucose readings together to see how your diabetes is in control or how your sugar is controlled. They don't do a day one scan, everybody. I think if you're not a diabetic, you have to request it. And it's a very, very helpful guideline to see how people are doing. Uh, I didn't make a slide for this. There's a couple of hormones in the body that are called uh, appetite hormones. One is called ghrelin and one is called leptin. And just basically, uh, simply put, ghrelin um, is a hormone that increases your appetite and it plays a role in body weight. It tells you to keep eating and eating and eating. That's ghrelin. And when you have leptin, leptin is a hormone that's made by fat cells actually, and it decreases your appetite. It tells you to stop eating. So there are certain foods that contain certain amounts of these ghrelin and leptin hormones and molecules. So we want to make sure we eat the ones that help 
turn off our eating and help us burn the fat better. And I'm, that's coming to that now, okay? Um, uh, can certain foods lower blood sugar? Yes, we can. When it comes, eating more food won't lower it, obviously, but there are foods that will prevent it from spiking. And there are foods that will actually, you could eat in combination in a certain way, and you will actually lower your blood sugar. So, of course, the goal is to keep as steady as possible through the day. Steady, balanced sugar. That's all through the day. We don't want to see these spikes. The spikes wreak havoc in our system. They wreak havoc in our emotions. And, and then you're hungry a couple of hours later, as I mentioned. And then you get, you're hungry all day long and you never get full. I used to always wonder why um, uh, we need a big pasta dinner at my house. And it was delicious. And I would walk away so stuffed. And then two hours later, I was hungry. It didn't make any sense. But that was because pasta is all carbohydrates. And same thing with Thanksgiving. When we eat a lot of food at the Thanksgiving dinner, we're stuffed. We are so stuffed. We can't even move. We can't even breathe. And then, well, how come three hours later we can eat again? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Okay. So our blood sugar rises when we eat foods that contain all those sugars and that break down into sugar. Okay. So we know it's bread and grains and, and all of the fruits that are very high sugar. So the key to this is eating more protein, more fat, more fiber. Okay. I think I'm repeating myself here. That's okay. Let's keep going. We will hear the recommendations. The recommendations for this, how do we keep our sugar in balance? First of all, we want to follow a minimally processed diet. You want to eat whole foods. You want to get rid of all the packages you can. Um, you want to eat whole quality foods, good quality foods like vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds, and good meats and good fish. Now, a lot of people will tell you to get rid of carbs altogether. This is uh, an extreme measure, and even diabetics don't need to do that. I will tell you, though, that I used to see nutritionists, unfortunately, back in the old days, um, put people on a, a cup of rice, you know, they measure out exactly how much a person should eat to keep their diabetes under control. A cup of rice, three slices of bread, whatever, whatever, you know, they give you a protein and a fat and a starch. Uh, you don't really have to include starch in your meal if you don't want to. But if you do, there's a certain way to eat it. There's a certain way to eat starches in your diet. You don't have to get rid of them. You can eat them at the end. You can mix them with other things in your diet and eat them after you eat your, your fats and your proteins because what the fats and the proteins do, they coat the lining of the intestine and prepare it for digestion and gets all your um, your probiotics and your prebiotics ready to go to start your the process of decomposing the food. But if you eat your carbohydrates first, like you eat this bread first and you eat nothing else, um, and unfortunately, even though the diet, the, uh, I just want to mention, the, I live in the Mediterranean and the Mediterranean diet is the most popular diet to go on now in terms of overall health all over the world. Um, I do notice that people start their days with lots of bread and they eat bread first and they don't, and then they eat their other food later. And it, it's really, this is what, this is the hallmark of weight gain and sugar spikes. So if you want to have your bread, make sure like it's a good whole grain bread and make sure you eat it with something like a nut butter or with some good yogurt or some good fruit with it because you really want to make sure you don't just eat bread by itself or pasta by itself or cookies and cakes by themselves. If you're going to eat those things at all, you have to treat yourself every now and then. People have to have their chocolate. People have to have their fruits. People have to have their cookies sometimes. Um, first of all, we want to try to cut those out as much as possible, the processed foods, but, but you can have them even on a daily basis is depending on the order that you eat them. Okay. Um, of course, you know, it's important to be realistic. You're probably not going to be a, able to get rid of all packaged foods in your life. I can tell you, I tell the story very often that when I used to go grocery shopping when my kids were little, I had one whole basket at the grocery store that was all packaged foods. It was all the Wacky Max and the chips and the uh, pack packaged rices and all these different things that I would buy. And the other cart, I had two carts always because we had a lot of company, even though three little kids didn't eat that much. We always entertained. Um, but the other basket would be my meats and my vegetables and my fruits and my fish and cheese and all that. And so now, fast forward 20 years later, when I'm trying to be more healthy every single year, I find that I can put everything in one basket. I do have a few packaged things in there, um, but it's very, very rare that I buy a huge amount of packaged foods anymore. Even the pastas, I take a second thought, do I really need those? I think if kids are coming over, I'll buy a bag of pasta and I'll try to buy the tri-colored ones with the spinach and all that stuff, which they usually don't like. But <laughs> I try the best I can to keep my house healthy for them. And they, a lot of them will eat it if there's nothing else there. Okay, so you want to make sure you eat your whole quality, like we mentioned, beans, nuts, nuts, seeds, quality meats and fish. Of whole food ingredients. Okay, now the energy bar, again, they're doing lots of research on these things. 
You can grab it. It's fast. It's quick. It's easy. And I give it to my soldiers all the time. And I'm feeling guilty about it because they can put it in their pocket. And when they're starving in the middle of the field, this is all they've got. So in that scenario, you really want to give somebody something that's going to give them a sugar rush to give them a bit of energy. But on a daily basis, those are not the healthiest things in the world. Um, same thing with the cinnamon toast crunch and, and, uh, and even honey nut Cheerios, all those things that we love so much. They are known to have such a huge spike of sugar after eating them. They're, they're kind of dangerous. They almost should be taken off the market, truthfully. And that's just my humble opinion. Okay. And don't forget bagels and cream cheese and French toast and Pop-Tarts. Um, they all kind of fit into the same category of increasing the spikes. You got to be really careful what you eat in the morning. And I'm going to mention that in a few minutes. Okay. So your minimally processed uh, lifestyles starting today. Minimal process. Okay. All right. You want to slow, you want to eat a lot of fiber because that slows down the digestion and it helps, it prevents the spikes. So here's your fiber, a lot of beans, a lot of um, legumes, a lot of these different foods. There are tables and tables of foods that are high in fiber and you want to eat these. You want to take a probiotic, which also helps increase the fiber because they might have prebiotic with them. But what we want to do is add protein and fiber because what these things do is um, again, with a fiber being green leafy vegetables and Brussels sprouts and broccoli and artichokes, raspberries, pears, lentils, peas, avocados, pumpkin seeds, all those things, they will um, lead to a less intense spike of sugar. So if you eat your sugars with fiber, those hot five fiber things, you will decrease the, you'll have a more gradual rise in your blood sugar. Same thing with protein. Protein also tempers the insulin. So in the morning for breakfast, have you ever tried having a salad and fish? And, and maybe a piece of toast too. So you can throw in your toast there and put some avocado on it. But what a way healthy way to start the morning. You have very gradual rise of, of your sugar um, for the next few hours. The amount of protein you need depends on a lot of factors. It depends on what diet you're on. But it uh, depends on what you weigh and what you've tried to lose weight. So that's a whole different discussion. But good animal sources, of course, you want to try to eat the best quality um, proteins you can with, if you can, wild-caught fish. If you can, grass-fed beef, um, pasture-raised chicken and eggs. Um, and if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, don't worry. You know, there's a lot of plant-based protein in all the vegetables we eat as well. So like fiber, fiber and protein now, fat also will buffer the blood sugar spikes. So what I'm saying here is you can, don't have to get rid of your carbohydrates, but you want to cut way down on them. You want to cut down the ones that are known to be the real evils, like the cereals and the candies. They say the candies out there, the worst ones are Twizzlers. Oh my God, that's my favorite. Twizzlers, candies, like you just don't eat them by themselves and don't eat them ever again. <laughs> I'm going to try to not eat them ever again or bring them in my house. It's just like a whole pure sugar thing and a whole rush, but basically you wouldn't eat that for breakfast in any case, but and you might want to, you know, like eat those cereals that look so tempting, those healthy, they call them healthy cereals, and they're not, they're not healthy in any way. The cereals that you would have oatmeal, and, you know, they look like granolas and all that stuff, they're not healthy. Make your own. Okay, let's go to, you want to how to swap out some high carbohydrates to balance your blood sugar better. So whenever possible, Get rid of the refined carbohydrates like sugars, like bread, white bread, like anything white, white bread, white pasta, white potatoes, you know, and switch it out for whole food sources like whole grains, sweet potatoes, fruit, which contain a number of vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants that you need for essential for your health. And you want to balance your meals, of course, too. Um, so eating your protein, your fiber, and healthy fat with each meal, okay? Protein, fiber, and healthy fat with each meal. Then you can throw in some carbohydrates, okay? But make those your mainstay and, and make your carbohydrates more like of a dessert or a treat for yourself. And this is going to be the way to make your blood sugar stable all day long. You can add green powders and things like that from various vegetables. You can uh, eat a lot of salads if you like. That, that does help too. That does buffer the short-term glucose and insulin spike, okay? So salads, all the vegetables are fantastic that way. And now you know too that late night eating is probably blood sugar's worst enemy, and that's because our bodies become more insulin resistant at night. Okay. So you want to make sure you try to eat, cut your eating off. Uh, this is why I love intermittent, intermittent fasting, which I've done a webinar on. We'll do it again, maybe with a, a more of an expert uh, person to talk to about this, because it's just such a beautiful way of eating. It allows your body to rest several hours a day from digesting and, and gives your body the whole 
a uh, certain 18 hours a day to repair the cells and to rejuvenate and rest the digestion. And so if you're going to be getting more insulin resistant as the day goes on anyway, you might as well try not to eat at night because then you're just going to defeat the purpose. Okay. We want to talk about sleep is good uh, because we want it, it helps uh, cause it helps us main, manage the cortisol levels, which also helps us deal with stress. So you want to aim for as many hours of night sleep as you can. You want to keep hydrated. That's why I've got this picture here. What does hydration do for you? I get a bunch of stuff to talk about that, which I forgot to put here. We know the hydration is good overall. It flushes toxins out of the system. Every, our bodies are 80% water. We need to, to just flush all the, uh, to hydrate everything because everything works better as it's hydrated. Your brain works better. Your lungs work better. Digestion works better. Your elimination works better. So keep yourself very, very hydrated is the best way to go about it as well. Uh, some people recommend eating smaller meals during the day. Uh, I don't, you know, all day long. I'm not sure I would do that because it wouldn't work for me, but uh, it might work for you instead of eating one huge meal. Now, my son, who is a very athletic guy and he's never been fat a day in his life, he does intermittent fasting and he eats one huge meal every day. So that works for him. And he's got great uh, insulin resistance and he's and normal. And he's got normal blood sugars and he doesn't check that often. But when he does, he doesn't feel that blood that blood sugar spike. He doesn't eat until two o'clock in the afternoon and he eats until, till uh, he eats his one big meal from two to eight sometime in between there. And that's, he's a huge pile of, it's like, you can't believe it. We laugh at him because it looks so silly, but he, I couldn't do that either. So I would have to do more like two meals in an eight hour period or something like that, but they would be smaller. And look at how healthy these are with mostly vegetables and meat and fish. Okay, you also want to make sure you exercise. There's something, a lot of good information about how exercise is supposed to surprise you greatly. That exercise is the best thing to defeat a sugar spike after a meal. You, they say, I want to just find here, I just, there was a research going on, very important research. If I can find it. I yeah, see these things are repeated. Okay, so you want to exercise regularly, but regularly all the time, but more importantly, uh, an hour or within an hour to three hours after you eat is the most crucial time to just get up and take a walk. We only did that on Thanksgiving <laughs> in my house because we were so stuffed, literally. Uh, but your, your muscles will use the glucose to function. So once you start using those muscles, you're absorbing a lot of the glucose out of your system. And that's brilliant, right? The body's brilliant. And instead of letting that glucose go up and up and up in your system, as soon as you can, actually, after a meal, a big meal especially, go for a walk, even if it's just for 15 minutes, because you're mo moving your muscles will absorb the excess sugar. So your insulin doesn't have to work so hard to mop up all that excess sugar. So over time, it really will help you keep the most, the most balanced sugar ever if you do this, if you this into a habit every single night. You want to break up your sed sedentary lifestyle, too. If you have a desk job, it's very difficult to do this. But here are a couple of recommendations for people who eat, eat lunch at their desk. Uh, you can stand or walk around while you're on a phone call. You can do squats while you're waiting for a meeting to start. You can walk around your house or in between meetings. Um, you can take breaks to do things like sweeping or vacuuming or something like that, tidy up a bit. Uh, you can take breaks to do chores, folding laundry. So these things are all movement and motion oriented, and this is really crucial in balancing your blood sugar every single day. Okay, so there's a woman I discovered, and she is called... Um, her name is, I can't say her last name. Her name is, okay, she's here. Jessie, Jessie in, po in Poche. She's French and she has been a lot, she's a microbiologist. She's done a lot of research and reading on uh, balancing blood sugar. It was really bothering her. And she's not a diabetic, she's a thin woman, but in France, you know, she realized that they started their morning off with just French breads and cheeses and, and the, the people weren't that overweight, but they're, they were very unhealthy. She felt, and she felt a lot of people have diabetes. So she started doing research in that direction and fast forward to today, which she's become a world expert on glucose and metabolism. And she's not a doctor, but she's a researcher. And she wrote an amazing book called the glucose revolution, the life changing power of balancing your blood sugar. And I have it written on the sidebar there. If you want to go look up her book. Now she makes a bunch of recommendations, which I think are brilliant in addition to, um, you know, eating all the, pro you know, taking a probiotic and make sure your gut health is in good shape and eating all the different foods that are, um, of course, keeping the gut healthy. I didn't mention that, but keeping, we've done this, talk about this so many times, keeping your digestion healthy by eating any kind of probiotic supplements, 
probiotic, probiotic rich foods like fear, plain yogurt, sauerkraut, kimchi, that kind of stuff. So that's going to help you set up too for a very good absorption of your sugar. So, so we do know that no single food or supplement or workout session or anything is a magic bullet, but to maintain a healthy blood sugar level and keep it in balance for good, we want to start again by minimal processing, drinking a lot of water, getting exercise as soon as possible after you eat, eating foods in the right combination, which I'm going to cover right now at the very end. Um, I do have a lot of tables of, uh, of foods here, but just too much for this lecture and people don't want to sit that long. But I can tell you the whole wheat grain breads are the best to eat. Um, you want to avoid white bread bagels and other things that are highly refined. Breads with added sugar, fruit breads with raisin toast, the worst. Okay, just saying, we all grew up on that. Uh, most fruits are okay, and you want to actually eat them at the end of your meal, um, as, which uh, what this woman, Jessie, talks about. Um, pineapples and melons, except for pineapples and melons, okay, most fruits have pretty low get, um, uh, glycemic index scores. And I'm not even talking about the number, it's 55 and lower, but that's not the top of the point today. The point is, is just look for yourself if you're interested to know which foods are high glycemic, which are going to spike your sugar, and which are going to keep it under control. So you can eat very freely, apples apricots, avocados, blackberries and blueberries, grapefruit, grapes, peaches. Some people say grapes are a little high. I don't, I've thought, seen two different uh, accounts of this. They say grapes will really spike your sugar. It's up to the, if you're a diabetic, you, wanna, you probably know more about this than me and you can let me know. Raspberries and strawberries, of course, are wonderful. Um, and fruits to joy, and they say stay away from any dried fruits. Dried fruits of any kind are just packed with sugar. And fruit juices, you know, our kids grew up on fruit juices. I, I, I did too, I think, to a certain extent, but they're just, pure processed sugar. And it's just a shame because kids have juice boxes every day in their hands. And really, um, you know, we're trying to switch over to healthier stuff now for our kids. I hope so. Um, and you know, too, that potatoes, of course, were high uh, glycemic index and they shoot the glucose right up, white bread, white flour, white rice. Switch to yams, switch to sweet potatoes. And of course, lots of nuts. Oatmeal is fine. Oat bran is fine. Um, I'm going to, I can produce a list. If you want to write to me, I'll give you this whole lecture and all the things that I've gathered. Um, you want to stay away again with from processed oats and processed, processed, uh, candy bars, cereals, that kind of stuff. Okay. Nuts and seeds. Most of them are very antioxidant and very healthy for you and loaded with magnesium and potassium, which is great. You need that too. So you want to eat the raw nuts if you can, raw almonds, cashews, walnuts, pecans, tree nuts, peanuts, peanut butter is good if it's healthier and sunflower seeds. But with the higher scores, if you were looking at glycemic index, the ones with the highest scores are cashews, macadamia nuts, roasted and salted nuts, and candied nuts. And of course, you want to eat all the good uh, legumes like chickpeas and lentils if you're a vegetarian, especially you really need those things. Um, the best ones to eat are the black beans, pinto beans, green beans, lima beans, navy beans. This is almost all of them. Black eyed peas, chickpeas, lentils, snow peas. Okay, you want to limit anything with added sugar, basically. And we know garlic, of course, is the overall popular food, antibiotic, antiviral. It's uh, been in a traditional to add that to diabetic diets for years and years. It helps reduce blood glucose as well by improving insulin sensitivity and helps with the secretion of it. Okay, last thing I want to mention. Oh, of course, too. Let's look at the foods. Why not? Hold on. A couple more foods. Just for a second here on the glycemic food pyramid, you can see in the very bottom, the most, uh, the highest index, um, the, the highest of, uh, let's look at the top, the highest glycemic index foods are going to be cereals and cookies and pretzels and cakes and all that. The next down are going to be your yogurts, milks, fish, tofu, and uh, nuts. The next one down are really good healthy fats. And um, the pastas too, that I think I'm questioning that one. I think I would put that at the top. And the bottom that has the, the best of uh, the, the best in terms of your more reliable, low glycemic index foods are gonna be uh, low glycemic fruits and all your green leafy vegetables and most vegetables actually. And you wanna eat your healthy high fat fish. Of course, anchovies are also wonderful. And haddock and herring, as long as they're not too salted, sardines. And eating these things are also going to give you a lot of good calcium too and, and um, vitamin D and vitamin C. Um, you want to might maybe limit um, mackerel and marlin and shark and swordfish. So those of us who are kosher don't have to worry. We don't need that, that anyway. What about yogurt? You can eat plain yogurt. It's usually the Greek yogurt they say are better for you. And it gives a very low glycemic index. And as long as it gives you a 50 or below, you can even see it on the labels. Okay. 
Greek yogurt and unsweetened yogurt and put some berries in it. Please avoid all of those sweetened yogurts with flavors and the, the fruits in them and the sugars added. Okay. So we want to make sure. I want to talk about Jessie. Where is she? Okay. So Jessie makes a couple of recommendations. Jessie makes the recommendations that we change the way we eat. Not even the amount that we eat. Look at all these great healthy foods. The berries and the avocados and the eggs and the fish. Okay, let me just leave this on here because it's pretty. Okay, she says, start off your breakfast as a savory one and not as a sweet one. As I was mentioned to you before, I figured this out when my kids had ADHD, that the cereals were making them bounce off the walls. And I wouldn't even allow them on, uh, on the Sabbath to have a bowl of cereal, but I regretted it because they were crazy the whole day. So, but they also, again, we don't want to spike their sugar and send them off to school and make them feel headachy and miserable. So it's going to be a very truly life-changing thing. Change your breakfast. You have some rice, even if you want to have some kind of uh, carbohydrate. Have even a baked potato, a, a, a sweet potato if you can. But make sure you don't eat a lot of sugars because it's the worst possible way to start the morning. And it's so easy to do. So easy to do. It took us many years to do it. I do have people in my house that still eat cereal every morning. I don't say anything because they know. Uh, I couldn't, buy, I don't actually eat, I never ate breakfast for years anyway. But when I do eat, the first thing I eat is going to be something like eggs and a salad. And it's delicious. So you want to have avocado um, handies, handy and a nut, really healthy nut butters. You can have your favorite fruits, but make sure you eat them at the end of the meal, like I said before. You can have almond butter, peanut butter, seeds, hemp seeds. Uh, what's really delicious is to make a soft boiled egg, maybe in oatmeal. And um, keep, you can keep the carb base. Again, don't throw away your carbohydrates. Just make, eat them minimally and eat them as the, the minimum part of your meal and start your morning off non-sugar, okay? Uh, Jesse says, don't eat naked carbs. What does that mean? There are things in isolation because they are going to be the first thing to spike your sugar, such as bread, pasta, rice, potatoes, tortillas, um, sugars, anything that's uh, that's not a fruit, anything that's in a package and anything that's not a fruit is going to be a pretty damaging sugar for your system. So when your kids ask for a snack, mm -hmm. this is why they ask to tell us to uh, give them an apple <laughs> because it's much healthier for them. And it's so tempting. As a grandma, I'm going to tell you now as a grandmother, I, um, it's very hard for me not to give my little granddaughter some treats, but I'm trying to respect my daughter and myself too. I don't want her to grow up thinking that she has to have sugar to make herself happy. Um, you know, she can get sweets from other things. My daughter actually makes her very, very healthy, um, cookies out of just dates and nuts, ground nuts, ground dates. And she loves these cookies, peanut butter. She loves them easy. Okay. Um, so start your morning off with a savory breakfast. Don't eat carbs in isolation. Um, you, you can eat your foods in a special order of vegetables first, proteins and fats before the carbs. Always eat vegetables, proteins, and fats before you eat the carbs. You can mix it together too, obviously. Like I said, you can have a toast. You can put avocado on it. Just make sure you have a salad with it too or something very healthy or eggs. And we know that gastric emptying is something that happens. Uh, it happens a lot faster if we eat in this order. And so she talks a lot about vegetable starters. So even if you go out to dinner, make sure you have a vegetable to start. Don't have uh, nachos and cheese. Sorry. Have, even if it's going to be breaded, which I hope you don't, but if you don't have a salad first or have some broccoli or cauliflower. Antipasto is something very popular to do. Um, vinegar. Vinegar is an interesting thing. I have to talk fast because my computer is running out of battery. Uh, vinegar is something that we hear about all the time. Um, we talk about the vinegar with the mother. Um, we talk about vinegar gummies, all these things. Vinegar is really very good at cutting the blood sugar. And if you have that before you eat, this is, the, she said, her biggest trick besides having a savory breakfast is to bring, she carries vinegar with her in her purse. And she puts a teaspoon or two in a glass of water and she drinks it before she eats anything. Now, why does she do that? She says, vinegar is the closest thing to the silver bullet or magic pill when it comes to stabilizing your glucose levels and avoiding the spikes. If you have one tablespoon of vinegar before a meal, in a tall glass of water um, and with your vegetable starter, you can cut the glucose spike in your meal up to 30%. And all those glucose will go right to your muscles if you start moving. And so your mitochondria burns more fats and your whole body overall has a better metabolism. So how about that? Start your, your meal with a glass of, uh, with a little bit of uh, apple cider vinegar in it. 
And uh, of course, everybody likes the one with the mother. I'm not going to give a commercial, uh, but people who even with, with PCOS and testosterone problems and things are finding they're having great success by doing this because we, as we know, PCOS, uh, polycystic ovary disease in women where they have problem getting pregnant and they have other issues too, they're overweight and things, they will drop weight instantly and they will have a better uh, reproductive health and they will, um, they will uh, digest their foods and, and to decrease their, their, their blood sugar spikes. Um, so she says that it's even better than lemon juice. Okay, that's just the, her opinion. You can look at it, read her, read her book. Take a walk, like I mentioned before, a walk is her favorite thing. 10 minute walk, she says, it's scientifically proven to push the glucose right into the muscles and the muscles needs it for, for energy. Muscles need glucose. So there you go. You can you still watch your movie afterwards or still at, at your computer afterwards. But first take a walk after every single meal. She says, eat your sugary foods last. Okay. And then we mentioned that before, always eat the sugary foods last and, um, or with other foods to, to temper it. But basically if you do your vegetable first and your protein and your fats that coats the lining of your intestines and gets it better for, gets it prepared for a better, a better digestion and decreases the amount of sugar that's going to spike in your system and eat whole fruit, not juiced or, or, or dried because they're really high sugar. So in concluding thoughts, we want to balance our nutrition. That's going to be the key to keeping healthy blood sugar levels. So eat right, exercise more, monitor yourself regularly. And if you have diabetes, please be a routine monitored. And um, being sedentary is not good for you. Um, just getting up and moving through your day is going to be the best thing you can do. I have a big impact on your blood sugar. And if you want more information about this, uh, look at the sidebar and read Jesse's book. It's amazing. Um, and uh, I wish all of us the best of luck in keeping a balanced blood sugar. Have a healthy week. And thank you for joining because it's always a pleasure to see everybody here. Take care.